This week, join me as I explore a biblical catastrophe of epic proportions. The destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. According to the book of Genesis, God exacted punishment on the cities of sin by destroying them in a rain of fire and brimstone. The demise of Sodom and Gomorrah stands as one of the great cautionary tales of the Old Testament. But did the cities actually exist? And if so, can science and archaeology explain how they met their end? To find out, I'll investigate charred ruins along the eastern Dead Sea. Examine a 50,000-year-old geological record. This band here, that indicates an earthquake. And create a biblical weapon of mass destruction. Ah, okay, that smells. We're digging for the truth, and we're going to extremes to do it. It's gonna be a great adventure! I'm Josh Bernstein. I'm at Jordan's most famous archaeological site, Petra. Isn't that spectacular? But I haven't come here to Jordan to explore a site celebrated for its beauty, but to learn about two sites destroyed for their wickedness, Sodom and Gomorrah. The book of Genesis refers to the residents of Sodom and Gomorrah as exceedingly wicked and sinners against the Lord. So God exacts his wrath on the two cities. Only one man escapes the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. Lot, the nephew of the biblical patriarch Abraham. God allows Lot, his wife, and his two daughters to flee the cities on one condition. They must never look back. Lot's wife disobeys God's command and is turned into a pillar of salt. It's a great story. But is there any archaeological evidence to confirm it? Did Sodom and Gomorrah actually exist? The two cities make their first appearance in Genesis 10.19. They're listed among the so-called five cities of the plain, Adma, Zeboim, Zoar, and Sodom and Gomorrah. Many biblical scholars place these five cities here in the Jordan Valley bordering one of the world's most famous bodies of water, the Dead Sea. Over the course of many millennia, water evaporated more quickly from the Dead Sea than it was replenished. Eventually, it became so salty that it could no longer sustain any life. Thus the name. But interestingly, some of the locals here refer to it by a different moniker, Buhayat Lut, Arabic for the Sea of Lot. At just over 1,300 feet below sea level, it's the lowest place on Earth. This is also the place where many scholars believe the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah once stood. Some believe they were on the western side in modern-day Israel. Others believe they were here on the eastern side in Jordan. And still others believe that the cities are actually beneath the very waters of the Dead Sea itself. In order to narrow my search, I've contacted Jordanian scholar Rami Khouri. For decades, Rami has compiled a written record of all the archaeological sites in Jordan. He's brought me to the Wadi Mujib Nature Reserve to meet a key figure from the Sodom and Gomorrah story. The physical testament to the enduring power of one of the Bible's most arresting symbols, Lot's wife. It's a message. It's a moral message which uh, is personified in the physical remains. Here she is. There she is. Can I go closer? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Lot's wife, perched above the Dead Sea Highway, is actually a salt-encrusted stone pillar etched by wind and water. She's big. Yeah. With a height of over 20 feet, she's an imposing figure, but maybe a little too big to be anything more than a biblical scarecrow created by local legend. So if we're looking at this metaphorically and not literally, what's the message? I think the message from the biblical text, certainly, and it goes throughout the whole text into the New Testament, uh, is that people should, should obey God, should be faithful, and should trust God. And if you don't obey God, you get zapped, again, throughout the Bible. So the people in this region could use this as sort of a boogeyman? 
to say you better listen to God when he speaks because otherwise you're going to turn into that pillar. That's right. I think that's the um, aim of the story. And, and of course, many stories in the Bible are like this. Mm -hmm. The interesting question is, well, when did these stories first originate? When did these narratives first become uh, institutionalized in the values and the memories sure. uh, uh, of a society? Rami explains the Bible was written as much as 1,500 years after the events of Sodom and Gomorrah supposedly took place. He says the Genesis account was likely passed down through centuries-old oral tradition and then later transcribed into the written word. These stories, these narratives, are based on facts that we can um, prove in many cases, geological facts, geographical facts, chronological facts, and historical facts. So there actually could have been a Sodom and Gomorrah? I think there were cities that were destroyed. You will certainly find sites where the archaeological evidence uh, synchronizes rather compellingly with the biblical evidence. Many accept the Bible as the Word of God unquestionable fact. But archaeology seeks physical proof, and Rami says there's plenty of things he wants to show me. Our first stop, the small city of Madaba, some 30 miles away, just south of the capital city of Jordan, Amman. He's taking me to see an ancient mosaic, one that contains clues to the precise location of the five cities of the plain. Madaba itself is world-renowned for the decorative stone floor mosaics that fill the Greek Byzantine churches. Byzantine originally at the bottom and then rebuilt uh, in the 19th century. During the construction of the Greek Orthodox Church of St. George, the builders found a 6th century mosaic embedded in the floor of this house of worship. And as they were rebuilding it as a church, they discovered this extraordinary mosaic map of the Holy Land. Rami says over 11,000 man-hours went into creating this 900-square-foot mosaic, and that the floor was originally composed of 2.3 million pieces of colored stone. This is where? I can't read any of this. Well, when you look at it from here, this is Jerusalem, walled city of Jerusalem. Okay. You have the Jordan River with the fish going up and down. Okay. You can see the Dead Sea with the two boats. And... Amazingly, the mosaic's key cities line up closely with their modern counterparts when positioned within a 21st century map, like Jerusalem, Jericho, and the Jordanian fortress at Karak. The apparent accuracy of the Madaba map has convinced Rami that the cities of the plain, including Sodom and Gomorrah, once stood on the Jordanian side of the Dead Sea. Are Sodom and Gomorrah on this map? Well, not completely, but let me Take you around this Bob side, Brent? and I'll show you. Okay. Here's what you want to see. Balak and Zohar, some, something this like that. This is Bella or Zohar. Remember the cities, the names of the five cities? Oh, here, Zohar. Yeah. Okay. Rami so points to a church just east of Zohar with a different inscription. Okay, so this, what is this here? To Agio L. To Saint L or to the Holy L. L. The letter L. Uh -huh. Lot, maybe? And we think that we think that L means lot. Unfortunately, the rest of the word is missing. But when you're tracking down the story of Lot, at least it's a start. But we do have Zoar, one of the five cities of the plain, and the mountains where Lot and his daughters took refuge. But this this is encouraging that one of the cities of the plain is here. So if I were looking for Sodom and Gomorrah or the other cities of the plain, I want to be here, southeast corner of the Dead Sea. That's cool. All right, that's where I'm going. I've come to the kingdom of Jordan in search of Sodom and Gomorrah, the twin cities that the Bible claims were destroyed by God because of their sins. In Genesis, Sodom and Gomorrah are identified as two of the five cities of the plain. Now, thanks to a 1,400-year-old map, I've identified the location of a third, Zoar. On the same map, Right next to Zoar, I was shown the image of an ancient monastery. Could this church hold further clues about the infamous Sin City? To find out, I need to go on a 50-mile journey south from the city of Madaba, to where one archaeologist believes he's found the ruins of the church shown on the Madaba map. 
the Jordanian army has agreed to give us a ride in one of their Hueys. Okay, and they're strapping me into my harness. <laughs> and then, yeah, thank you. So they can buckle me into the helicopter. Good. Don't worry. All right. All right. Sure. Joining me for the trip is British Museum archaeologist Konstantinos Politis. In 1987, Konstantinos first began excavating outside the town of Safi, thought to be ancient Zoar. It wasn't easy. Daytime temperatures there can exceed 130 degrees Fahrenheit. But after eight long years of digging, he managed to uncover the ruins of the ancient church we're going to see. And here it is. It's exactly where the Madaba map placed it. Sitting on a sheer cliff and facing out towards the southeastern edge of the Dead Sea. From the chopper, we get a bird's eye view of the entire site. It's spectacular. But why would anyone have built this church in such an inaccessible and rocky place? Our helicopter can't set down on top of the mountain, so we land at its base, nearly 500 feet below the archaeological site. To get back up to the ancient monastery itself, we need to climb a series of steep switchbacks. Stone steps carved into the side of the Rocky Mountain. Yeah, this is the, Konstantinos tells me the mosaic map at Madaba had intrigued him for years. Yeah. Oh. So when you first started excavating this site, it all looked like, like random hillside. Here. Oh yeah, just like you know, you see on the side of this hill, it's all covered. Nothing, nothing was there. Finding hard evidence for the existence of the church in the mosaic was the first of many discoveries at this site. Look at this floor. Yeah, it's a beautiful mosaic, but let me show you something. I've got something special here. What is really important is this inscription here. Mm -hmm. Now, I know you can't see it very Constantinos well. shows me an ancient tablet. Okay. You'll see how the letters come to life. The stone face has been weathered by time. But with a quick splash of water, the inscription comes into view. Oh, wow. That's much better. And it says, Saint Lot, please bless your servants in Greek. The Madaba map referenced this site as the Church of Saint El, with the rest of the word missing. Konstantinos believes his discovery proves that this was, in fact, the Church of Saint Lot, a place dedicated to the nephew of Abraham. If you look down here, this is a beautiful Greek inscription which mentions the names of the bishop and the abbot of the monastery, but most important, the date, April 605 AD. So this place is 1,400 years old. If that sounds old, it's nothing compared to what he discovered behind a sealed doorway at the back of the church. Konstantinos believes that this cave is the very reason the monastery was built the in such itself. a challenging location. This is the entrance. Can we go in? Of course. All right. Came a long way to see this. The monks who built this place clearly went to great lengths to safeguard this cavern. And Konstantinos thinks he knows why. In Genesis 19.30, the Bible states Lot and his daughters escaped the destruction at Sodom and Gomorrah by taking refuge in a mountain cave near Zoar. Dark. Pretty dark. The monks, according to Constantino's theory, believed this was the cave of Lot. So this, is, this here is where the monastery ended. And then this is all the natural cave. Natural cave. We dug below the floors of the Christian church and found mm -hmm. These walls, which are almost 5,000 years old. And look at this pottery. Well, we have pots, yes, which we found in this area. There were burials and occupation. Mm -hmm. This dates from the early Bronze Age period, uh, almost 5,000 years ago. No one knows the exact year that Sodom and Gomorrah might have been destroyed. But biblical scholars estimate it would have been between the early and middle Bronze Ages, between 2500 and 1700 BC. And the artifacts found here prove that this cave was occupied during this same period. So I have to ask, is this Lot's cave? Well, the Christians seem to think so, because they built this church over 
this cave, this natural cave. But this hillside is just full of caves. I mean, just looking around the landscape outside, yep. this place is dotted with them. Yep. There are other caves in the area. Why did they choose this one? Yeah. Probably because there was an ancient oral tradition of that's Lot's cave up there. So when the Christians came, they decided to build this church over what was already thought of to be Lot's cave. Mm -hmm. So it's a matter of belief. They believed it. But there's no smoking gun, no single artifact confirming that the family of Lot ever sheltered here. Still, there is another way to get closer to the story of Lot, his family, and their journey to the cities of the plain. I'm going back to the biblical record to retrace the path Lot may have taken to arrive at the doomed city, Sodom. According to Genesis 13, Lot and his uncle Abraham share land in Bethel, within modern-day Israel. But Lot decides to move his family and belongings southeast into the Jordan Valley to expand his domain and provide ample room for his herds to grow. Genesis 13, 12. Lot settled in the cities of the plain and moved his tents as far as Sodom. But the question is, where is Sodom? In order to pick up Lot's trail, I've contacted some Jordanian guides familiar with the territory. According to them, we're now close to the point where Lot may have entered Jordan some 4,000 years ago. Back in the day, they would have taken donkeys. But this way is much more fun. Yalla. Scholars believe camels were introduced into the Jordan Valley several centuries after the time of Lot. But apart from the camels, Lot would be surprised to see this once fertile plain as a rocky desert today. According to Genesis, this was once a lush and inviting land, like the Garden of the Lord. But despite this beautiful setting, Lot may have been suffering culture shock. The early Bronze Age was a time of rapid change in ancient Jordan the first cities were beginning to appear. It would have been an alien culture for a tent-dwelling shepherd like Lot. My guides tell me that tonight we'll join a local Bedouin tribe and pitch our tent near the very spot where many locals and scholars believe the biblical Sodom once stood. Josh. Yes, Josh. Nice to meet you. You're welcome. Thank you. The Bedouin preserve a way of life that's changed little since the time when the biblical Lot would have erected his tent outside Sodom. Mm -hmm. Okay, you just tell me what to do and I'll do it. I, All right, sir. But uh, yeah. I will help give it a shot. Like Lot, the Bedouin people are shepherds. For millennia, these nomads have rejected city living. Even today, they continue to move their herds of sheep and goats across the open desert landscape. Their trademark tents are made of woven goat hair blankets. They use carpets and wool pillows for bedding. And what's the difference between the rooms? Well, it's uh, not different. Okay. It's no difference. One for the women and two for the men. One we used for sleep. And the other is open for the guests when they're coming in the night to have a sittings, talkings, stories with all of the people. These tents have hardly changed since the time of Lot, when the Bible states he and his family made camp outside Sodom. Together, we build a fire for warmth before bedding down for the night. So we've been here for several hours. Some of the guys are sleeping. Some are chatting. Uh, it's, it's definitely a magical evening. I'm here in the valley, uh, Jordan Valley, with the Dead Sea just to my west, and in the distance I can see the lights of Israel. And I'm here in a Bedouin tent, which uh, is sort of a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to experience wandering, a stranger in a strange land. And I think that this probably has not changed at all since the time of Lot and Avram as they were making their way across Canaan. I'm in Jordan, looking for archaeological evidence behind one of the Bible's most famous tales, the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. 
In the ruins of a Byzantine monastery, I saw an ancient refuge that early Christians believe was the place where Lot and his daughters took shelter before God's destruction of the sin cities. I then traveled by camel to retrace the path Lot may have taken into the Jordan Valley. Now, my goal is to find evidence of the city he ultimately fled, Sodom. Thank you. Many scholars and historians believe the best archaeological candidate for Sodom is a desert ruin called Babidra. To the casual eye, it looks just like any other rocky outcrop. But for Dr. Thomas Schaub, the lead archaeologist at this site, Babidra represents an ancient fortress, established during the early Bronze Age here in Jordan. You can see the face of the wall here has collapsed somewhat, but you have to imagine this as having a mud brick superstructure okay. going up about 30 feet. Today, so it's hard to see, but this was once a 10-acre city enclosed by these massive walls, over 23 feet wide and over 30 feet tall. Dozens of mud brick houses were stacked along the interior. At its height, Babidra housed and protected as much as 1,000 people. So it was quite an impressive area, but you have to use your imagination a little bit to little bit. Yeah, recreate little bit. that. But we still Today, the ruin doesn't look like much. Over the past 4,300 years, many of its walls and its mud brick homes have collapsed. It's difficult to see where the city ends and the desert begins. Now, this isn't exactly the place where I'd want to build a town. There's no. nothing here. It had to be a much richer area, and from the rainfall that we can reconstruct the patterns, it was like a garden area down here. Genesis 13.10 states, Lot lifted up his eyes and saw all the valley of the Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere, like the garden of the Lord. If Babidra represents the biblical Sodom, it doesn't seem to match the profile. This landscape is dry and rocky, yet archaeologists are convinced that it was able to support a huge population. Let's go find out why. Dr. David McCreary is a paleobotanist, a specialist in ancient plants. He's discovered a wealth of foods and grains at the site. Many date back over 4,000 years, to the time when Lot would have come to the Jordan Valley. Good to meet you. Welcome to my office. Yeah, it's a nice office. To determine the fertility of this ancient site, David Good. uses a simple process. It's called flotation. I help him by agitating the water within these two plastic tanks. We're testing a soil sample David collected earlier. It's from an ancient cooking pit here in Babidra. Is this your first time? This is my first time agitating soil. Okay. By pouring the ashy soil into the water, it's possible to separate traces of ancient crops from mere sand and dirt. The organic material floats to the surface, where it's strained from the water and then carefully examined. So, pretty impressive, huh? Uh, sure. You think so? Well, most of what we've got here are just little pieces of charcoal. What we're looking for primarily are geometric shapes. The geometric shapes represent the best candidates for cooked seeds. But they're still hard to find. Oh, I found one. OK, great, great. David tells me it's a 4,500-year-old grain of barley. That's exciting. That's pretty exciting, I've never been so excited about one single grain of barley in my life. You know, sometimes we will find... During his years of research at Babidra, David collected and identified thousands of these ancient seeds. In addition to barley, there's wheat, linseed, and figs. All these crops share one thing in common. They only grow where there's plenty of water and irrigation. Especially the emmer wheat, it's typically grown under irrigation. The six-row barley has to be grown under irrigation. The mm -hmm. linseeds... If they're longer than four millimeters in length, uh, that's another indication of irrigation. It couldn't be just a heavy rainfall. Uh, no, Not yeah, this, you, ha you have region. to have a you know a sustained rainy season. And in this particular region, the average annual rainfall is less than two inches per year. Rainfall during the early Bronze Age wasn't much greater than it is today, but there was plenty of water to be had. 
Studies have shown that the level of the Dead Sea was nearly 400 feet higher than it is today. There's also evidence of an ancient lake bed and natural springs right at the base of Babadra's walled perimeter. It was this steady supply of groundwater that allowed these city dwellers to irrigate their plants. The Bible describes this region as well watered. Right. right? And I'm looking for these cities of the plain. Is it, does this meet that criteria? I would say uh, Babadra is probably the best watered, certainly would have been one of the most fertile uh, parts of the entire region during the early Bronze Age. So absolutely, there would have been resources here that anybody would want to take advantage of. Broken rocks and seeds offer a snapshot of Babadra as a city of prosperity. But is this the kind of well-established and enduring city that would have brought Lot to its doorstep? One that could qualify as a candidate for Sodom. To help me better understand the people and the ancient customs of Babadra, Tom Schaub takes me to the city graveyard to examine the burial record. This pockmarked plain, just outside the city walls, is one of the largest cemeteries in the Middle East. You notice all the bones and the broken pottery. This is all from tomb robbers. You can see we've got all kinds of chambers around here. Let's see if we can find one that has a... This was the final resting place for the people of this Bronze Age city for 1,200 years. The archaeology here is complete. So Tom gives me the okay to see one of the burial chambers myself. Oh. If I'm not back in five minutes, send a search party. We'll send a search party, right. This grave is over 4,000 years old. It's a tight fit, like entering a desert igloo. The dome chamber is only three feet tall and five feet deep. Like all the chambers here, this one's now empty. But when Tom and his team excavated these burial chambers in the 1970s and 80s, they found over 200,000 skeletons in over 20,000 tombs. Around the outside edge of the chambers, special pots were placed as dedicated offerings to the deceased. The contents of these burial sites were recorded, removed, and preserved. Good uh, day for laundry. Ugh. Tom has brought some of the funerary pieces from inside the burial chambers to show me. All of these pots are over 4,300 years old. The pottery, the agricultural record, the massive numbers of skeletal remains. These all point to the fact that Babadra was a sizable Bronze Age community that thrived in the Jordan Valley for centuries. A place of prosperity, a world not of tents, but of fixed homes with a food supply that was guaranteed a city that might have attracted Lot. So if, going back to Lot's time, if he were seeking a place, and if Lot were going to a city of the plain, this could be one of them. Yes, if, if, if Lot was traveling during the early Bronze Age and came down to this area, it would be the only place. If you have an individual like Lot or any group traveling through the early Bronze Age at that time, this would be the place to set. This was the only place. It's the dominant town for that period from the third millennium on in this okay. part of the area. But this is where the archaeological record of Babadra seems to part company with the biblical story. Its collapse was more of a whimper than a bang. Tom tells me the city was slowly abandoned over a period of a hundred years. The Bible states that the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah ended in fire and destruction, and there's no evidence of conflagration at Babadra. To find Sodom, I need physical evidence of a fiery cataclysm here in the Jordan Valley. I'm following in the footsteps of Lot, nephew of the biblical patriarch Abraham, in a quest to find the infamous cities Sodom and Gomorrah. I've investigated the ruins of an early Bronze Age site, considered by some to be the biblical Sodom. I've also seen its burial ground, thought to be one of the largest in the Middle East. But this ancient city shows no evidence of being completely destroyed by fire. And the biblical description of Sodom and Gomorrah's final hours is as clear as it is apocalyptic.
Genesis 19. Then the Lord rained down upon Sodom and upon Gomorrah brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. And he overthrew those cities and all the plain and all the inhabitants of the cities and that which grew upon the ground. It's a description of total devastation covering miles of territory along the Dead Sea Plain. Today, many scholars believe the biblical story could be the retelling of a natural disaster. If the devastation of Sodom and Gomorrah was as terrible as the Bible describes, could some geologic record still exist? To find out, I'm leaving Jordan and traveling west into Israel, to Ein Gedi, fewer than 30 miles from Babadra. I'm with Dr. Shmuel Marco, an expert on the geological history of the biblical lands. Shmuel wants to show me a remarkable record of the many earthquakes that have shaken this region. Earthquakes that date back to the time of Abraham and Lot, and well beyond. Together, we'll examine these chalky white walls in search of clues in the geological record. Clues that might explain the upheaval that caused the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. We're going to climb up there. The climbing gear is already there, so we'll have to repel this cliff over there on top. Fine. Okay. Lead the way. Shmuel tells me there have been 17 recorded earthquakes in the Dead Sea region just in the past century. The Salty Sea sits right on top of an immense geological fault. It's a tear in the Earth's crust that stretches from Lebanon to Mozambique. A 4,000-mile geological fault line that marks the dividing line between the African and Arabian tectonic plates. If this fault was active at the time of Sodom and Gomorrah, could an earthquake help explain how the cities were destroyed? That's a nice view. This is the Dead Proper. Sea. This is the Moab Mountains. Yeah. We are standing on the, on the bottom of an ancient lake that was here in the last ice age until about 15,000 uh, years ago. A drastically falling water table has left this lake bed very high and very dry. Today it stands on the edge of an arid desert gully 150 feet deep. Our plan is to rappel down the cliff's edge so Shmuel can show me the layers of sediment left behind after the lake receded. Let's go check it out. The rock is soft and crumbles beneath our feet. But it's still easy to see that this cliff face is composed of thousands upon thousands of tiny layers. In fact, each layer was formed by the cyclical deposition of sediment on the floor of this ancient lake. What does one line represent? One layer represents uh, uh, one season deposited at the bottom of a lake. White layers represent the summer seasons, and brown layers represent winter. So you can date these layers the way someone might date tree rings. Exactly. These are the tree rings are the, the exact analog to these layers. The, the, the difference is that trees don't live 50,000 years. Here we have more than 50,000 years record. Mm -hmm. So this is a very long record here. We have mm -hmm. the longest record on Earth. Right. Wow. This 50,000-year record allows geologists to clearly see when earthquakes shook the region. We're looking for layers like this that mm -hmm. are uh, disturbed. Shmuel mm -hmm. points to a large band of sediment different from the rest. Mm -hmm. It's thicker and jumbled. The sediment accumulated up to here. Above this was water. Mm -hmm. And then an earthquake shook the bottom. And all this thickness of layers was mixed and all chaotic here. Mm -hmm. This is one earthquake that disrupted a, a layer that's worth several hundreds of years of deposition. Okay. Yes. Shmuel explains that this earthquake would have registered over 6.0 on the Richter scale more than enough to have destroyed a city that, like Sodom or Gomorrah, was built of mud bricks and stone. And according to Shmuel, the evidence is very compelling that this is precisely what occurred. You see this? It tells us that around 4,000 years ago, there could have been an earthquake. There were earthquakes in this region of time. 
So in this case, the geological evidence supports the possibility of Sodom and Gomorrah actually being destroyed. Absolutely, yeah, it's very likely. So it's, well, it's not just possible, it's likely. It's very likely. Still, an earthquake alone isn't enough. To fully corroborate the tale of Sodom and Gomorrah's destruction, I need more than a seismic event. I need fire and brimstone. And I know just the man for the job. I'm rejoining Rami Huri at the eastern edge of the Dead Sea, on the Lisan Peninsula. We're fewer than 10 miles from the ruins of Babadra, and 20 miles from Safi, thought to be ancient Zoar. Rami has told me of an intriguing idea. If he's right, he'll be drawing a direct line from the Genesis story to where we're now standing on the Dead Sea Plain. Yeah, everything that's mentioned in the Bible and the story of Sodom and Gomorrah mm -hmm. in terms of natural resources and geology and terrain is still here. It hasn't changed uh, very much. Rami explains that one of the Bible's supernatural resources, brimstone, exists here in its natural state. Yeah. What do you think that is? I don't know, some sort of chalk? That's almost pure sulfur. Sulfur? Pure sulfur. Very high uh, quality. Tastes like sulfur. And it's throughout the walls here? It's throughout, not just throughout the walls, it's throughout this whole area. The whole area is full of this stuff. Hey, right, let's get a couple more of these babies. Okay. And I'll show you what, uh, what happens to it. That's a nice one. It pretty well, yeah. I'm not exactly sure what Rami hopes to show me with this pile of sulfur, but he better make it quick. It's getting dark out here. Pick it up, let me show you. You know what happens to sulfur when you light it? Well, it lights, catches fire. Oh, okay. Ah, okay, that smells. Wait a minute. Yeah, yeah, put it down. That's ah. burning sulfur, otherwise known as brimstone. I, in my whole life, I didn't know what brimstone was. Well, brimstone just means burning stone in uh, sort of medieval English. References to fire and brimstone are found throughout the Bible. In fact, they're the preferred instruments of divine retribution. And Rami explains brimstone was used as a fuel throughout the Dead Sea Plain for thousands of years. But no physical evidence has ever been found that burning brimstone once fell from the sky. So it's another part of the Bible which is remarkably found in the landscape here. Based on human reality. Huh. Then does that lend credibility to the idea of Sodom and Gomorrah actually happening? Well, it certainly makes it credible to the people in this region because they would remember something about a destruction of a city that may have happened possibly through a natural phenomenon mm -hmm. or possibly through the intervention of God. So when they talk about fire and brimstone, this is what they're talking about. You like that coming down on you. Sodom and Gomorrah. Could the biblical story of their sudden destruction possibly be true? In Israel and Jordan, I saw evidence of repeated earthquakes and witnessed burning brimstone firsthand. Okay, that smells. But actual archaeological evidence pointing to the annihilation of these cities has proved much harder to find. Now, on the last leg of my journey, I'm traveling 15 miles south to an archaeological site called Numera. It's an early Bronze Age city that also dates back to the time when Abraham and Lot are thought to have lived. Unlike the last ruin I visited, Babidra, this city suffered a dramatic and almost instantaneous collapse around 2400 BC. I'm rejoining archaeologist Thomas Schaub to learn more about the site he discovered in 1973 and to see if there's something in the archaeological record here that ties Numera to Sodom and Gomorrah. When we excavated here, this was a straight face and you had a beautiful looking tower. What we found on the bottom of here, and I actually can show you the, the spot mm -hmm. under this ash, flat on a horizontal floor, yeah. were two skeletons, one with a rock off the top of its head, who had clearly been killed in the collapse of the tower. Bodies? 
Two bodies. Two bodies here. The two skeletons almost side by side. Like this. Right. And the feet stretched out. Okay. At that angle. Okay. And uh, <laughs> clearly had been killed in the last phases of the tower with the tower collapsing on top of them. Heads crushed. By the falling stones from the tower. This photograph shows the two early Bronze Age skeletons found beneath the fallen tower. A stone shattered this skull. Something terrible must have happened for these bodies to be left unburied. Tom believes an earthquake may have triggered the tower's collapse some 4,400 years ago. Well, this, as you probably know, is a very active tectonic zone here in the Jordan Valley. We've had 17 earthquakes in the last 100 years that they've recorded. And it's possible that an earthquake could have caused this damage. It's very possible. Uh, we're not sure, mm -hmm. but that's one possibility. Well, let's take then a... Tom takes me to another part of the site. For many people, it offers a profound connection between the historical Numera and the biblical account of Sodom and Gomorrah. He leads me to a pit where paleobotanist David McCreary is waiting for me. David wants to show me a remarkable series of layers in the soil, which record the final hours of Numera. Exactly what's going on. What's very clear is that we've got uh, two burn layers. Mm -hmm. uh, a burn layer up here, and you can see chunks of charcoal. Yeah. Those are probably from the wooden beams that would have supported uh, the roofs. This layer is between 20 and 30 centimeters thick. Okay. And then below that you have a much hotter, or what I'm interpreting is a hotter burn layer. Whiter is hotter. Whiter is hotter, yeah, that's this ash. So this is layer. not a small fire that got out of control. This is a huge fire that burned everything. It certainly shows up in every part of the city that we've excavated so far. And that would, that would mean that this whole city was consumed in fire. That would certainly be a strong implication. Uh, it appears as if the entire city is burnt right. and then abandoned. We don't have evidence of occupation after uh, the destruction of this layers. If the writers of Genesis were aware of Numera's destruction, this might have provided the inspiration for the biblical story. A Bronze Age city literally burned to the ground along the edge of the Dead Sea Plain, correlating closely to the time of Lot. But given where we are relative to the Dead Sea, relative to the stories in the Bible, I'm seeing a city here that was completely destroyed by fire. Right. Could this have any relevance to the stories of Sodom and Gomorrah? Uh, it could, I suppose. Um, as an archaeologist, again, I think we're restricted to the evidence so that we can only say that there was a massive dis uh, destruction. Fire destroyed the uh, entire city in a catastrophic event, mm -hmm. and the evidence would suggest that after that fire, people did not resettle at the site. The cause of that destruction, mm -hmm. I think, from an archaeological point of view, is just up in the air. We just don't have the evidence to say whether it was uh, a man-made or a natural disaster of some kind. All we can say from the, from the material evidence is there was a fire, destroyed the city, the people didn't return. Whether the biblical account involving the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah was the retelling of a natural or supernatural event, we may never know. But we do know the cities of the plain were susceptible to earthquakes. And this was a region rich in combustible fuels, like brimstone. This charred ruin can't be ruled out as one of the Sin cities. If one day archaeologists can definitively place Lot in the Dead Sea Plain during the Early Bronze Age, the truth about the final locations of Sodom and Gomorrah may finally be confirmed. <laughs>